Boa noite a todos. Good evening. I would like to thank all of you for being here with us at this meeting, which is being held because of the Mario Carvo Neto Nameless Spirits exhibition, which is on at the Sao Paulo IMF. Before starting, I would like to make to describe myself. And then we can start our chat. I am Sergio Bulli. I am the photography coordinator of the Moreira Salles Institute. I am a Caucasian man with silver hair. I am wearing a gray sweater, and I am wearing white earphones. And behind me, there's a bookcase. With us, we also have our friends who will make the translation into sign language. I'd like to introduce them. Vanya Mantovan. Vanya is a Caucasian woman with dark hair, dark eyes. She's wearing a black uh, blouse and against a neutral background. We also have Karina Oliveira, who will take over afterwards, who's 27 and black. And uh, she's wearing a black blouse. And she is against a white wall. Well, first, I would like to thank our guest for being with us, Dr. Mark Silly, who is the executive director of the Autograph Agency in London, UK, and also research fellow in decolonial uh, from the University of London. Together with Mark Silly, we have Osorio, who was the curator of the exhibition, and who has been working in the arts sector for a long time. He was a university professor, a curator of the Museum of Modern Art in Rio de Janeiro, has worked thoroughly in the field of arts and has worked with us on a research project here at IMS that gave rise to this exhibition. This is a joint project between the Mario Carboneto Institute and IMS. Without this partnership, this project would not have taken place. It is a profound research project of Mario Cravo's works. And now the exhibition is on, and it is important to mention that the publication <coughs> associated to this or corresponding to this exhibition is available at the bookshops and here at the Institute also a publication which documents this whole process around the research for this exhibition. So I'd like to now give the floor to Luis Camilo Osorio, who will be our moderator together with Professor Mark Sile. And once again, I thank them for being with us. And all of the questions may be forwarded to us in, uh, through Facebook and YouTube. And also at the end of this meeting, we will also be able to address these questions first to Mark Silly and Luis Camilo Osorio. Welcome you all, Silly Osorio. It's up to you. Thank you, Sergio. I'm stopping with my self-description. Um, my name is Luis Camilo Osorio. I'm a white man, bald, glasses, uh, gray sweater, have bookshelf behind me. And I want to thank the IMS for the invitation and the Instituto Mario Cravo Neto as well to create the exhibition of Mario Cravo Neto. And it's a big, big pleasure to be here with Mark Sealy. And as I mentioned him last week, 
uh, had the opportunity to read his book that was launched last year, if I'm not wrong, and it's entitled um, To Decolonize the Camera, Decoloning the Camera Photography in Racial Time. And it was, I learned a lot with your book, and it was a pleasure to read. It's like reading a novel, although it's very dense theoretically, and it's an amazing reading through the 20th century and trying to create an alternative narrative to the history of photography. And well, we're having this conversation and I'm speaking in English because I think we make it more informal. We can hear each other's voice, which is always good because we have so many mediations nowadays that at least the voice is something direct between us and makes it make it more intimate. So, uh, I mean, well, following in English through the whole conversation. And well, to start with, Mark, um, could you talk a little bit about your background as a writer, a critic, and a curator, and when did you arrive at Autograph, if I'm not wrong, I think it was in 1991. And can you explain a little bit the politics of this space and how it is in the English uh, art photography scene and, and what has changed throughout these 30 years? Can you talk a little bit about that? Because yeah. I think your experience is quite unique. Of course. Um, first of all, I'll, I will describe myself. I am Black, Afro-Caribbean, mixed race, working class, um, um, living in London. I'm sitting in a room um, in front of my windows, which are slatted. There are no images behind me. I'm bald and I'm wearing square framed black rimmed glasses. And I'm wearing a grey sweater with a white t-shirt underneath. So um, that's a lot of questions, really. I, I guess I went to art school uh, 1982, 85. Um, I guess also in the UK, it was a particular time of, um, of Thatcherite Britain, heavy right wing, new political formations. The riots in the UK had already occurred, 81, 82. There was a lot of social unrest. A huge amount of poverty, huge amount of um, social change. Being an art student at that time meant that you were young and radical and engaged. And I was fortunate enough to be around a constituency of like-minded, what I would say, first generation black art students who were, I suppose, unsettled, dissatisfied with the politics of race, rights and representation. We were fully aware of how the media had framed the black subject. And we were also fortunate enough to be in a city that was still predominantly um, left wing um, owned by the various Labour Party. So although Margaret Thatcher was thoroughly um, in control of the country, London was very much on the left and remain so, and there's very much always been a republic of uh, left-wing thinking. So it was a good time to be in London and a good time for change. There was also a very progressive uh, local authority, um, like the regional government, which had um, money and wanted to encourage, if you like, or respond to what was clearly a crisis. And that crisis was is that there was no sense or no support for what was then seen as diverse arts practices. And it meant that things like um, free concerts in the park by bands were funded. It meant that um, you know, artists could get little bits of money to make things and do things. And that meant people were in conversation, cheek by jowl, close to each other, talking about what they meant, what they wanted to do, what they wanted to achieve. And it meant that various, all kinds of incredible groups, queer groups, black groups, women's groups, disabled groups, there was a, an incredible kaleidoscope, if you like, 
of contemporary practices beginning to emerge in the mid 80s, whether it was Joe Spence, whose work I'm sure you know, looking at body politic, people like Laura Mulvey were talking about the male gaze. Professor Stuart Hall was talking about, again, race, rights, representational, cultural studies had a huge impact. Postmodernist theorists and thinkers like Homi Baba were crashing in onto the discourse. Paul Gilroy was writing 30 years ago, there ain't no black in the union, Jack. Young, <laughs> young incredible thinkers like Coburn and Mercer, who was you know, beginning to formulate teaching courses on this idea of race and representational politics. So there was a, what you call like a groundswell, an emergent sense that things were going to be changed and they were going to be challenged. And Autograph is one of those organizations that comes together from very much a kind of grassroots people in the room type space. And through um, fairly enlightened, a problematic term, fairly enlightened offices or funding bodies begins to understand the, 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 the way the system works in terms of gathering support and gathering finances and constituting the, an organization so that something so that so that so that things can begin to be formulated incredible turbulent times 88 is when the organization is actually funded um, turbulent times because of the kind of people that were around there was lots of different black political perspectives asian perspectives african perspectives caribbean perspectives black political perspectives and if you can imagine having a lot of these people in the same room at the same time with very limited resources, it was a pretty fractious time as well, both internally and externally. So this was the politics of, uh, of gender, of black women's voices, trying to create this very much how we are now, in a sense, the wheel has kind of turned again. This, this space where you could begin to articulate all these various different discourses and people fell in love, people fell out of love, but what, what, was, what, was, what was clear is that when I, when, when I arrived, is that there was a sense that you, that, that I, I sensed that this was a moment. If we could make this thing work, if we could keep the thing together, I was absolutely convinced that there was an agency that had a place that would begin to, if you like, amplify the kind of critical thinking and the things that would be made that were quite unique in my view to the uh, black cultural practices and especially photographic practices that were happening in the UK. I think photography in the UK was quite, was, was also very much outside of the fine arts. There was this sense of community dark rooms. There were spaces inside schools where you could go and print things. There were various workshops happening and there were various small galleries beginning to open. So it was this kind of other and very much associated with documentary practice. So there was these, it was kind of outside of the mainstream as well. So it attracted this kind of left wing activist kind of voice within it. So it was always seen that, you know, trying to tell stories from the kind of marginalized perspectives. And I think that that culture also galvanized people together, spaces again, where people could come together. Interesting magazines like 10-8 magazine, were publishing critical theory and photography together, creative camera magazine, um, camera work, the gallery spaces with dark rooms underneath, subsidized spaces where affordable practices could, could happen. And also in London at the time, you could survive as a young person. It wasn't, an ex it wasn't such an expensive place to be. You had housing co-ops, you still had some social housing, you had rundown areas which could be squatted in People could come to a cosmopolitan centre and be part of something. You could get by. Now London, I think, has completely changed and those days are, are absolutely impossible. All of this, all of this contributed to a radical, you know, um, community of practitioners who were determined to try and change the way and represent the way or to problematize mainstream kind of... Uh, representational fields that framed the black subject as problematic or outside of history or not worthy or simply not seen. And to bring people into the frame was a really important aspect of that. I wanted to, uh, um, you know, from, from my background came from um, art school. 
news media, and then working in a traditional photographic uh, agency space. So I understood how the news media work and the circulation of images and syndication of, um, of rights. And so I brought both the art school and the photography um, um, industry into the kind of role of director and was quite determined to think about publishing, not just exhibitions, to think about um, circulation of images, to think about networks, and to think, of course, about um, fundamentally building a solid financial bedrock for the organization, which was always and remains a challenge. It's, it's interesting because, as I mentioned to you when we talked last week, that during the 80s, I stayed for three years in London. And well, the atmosphere is exactly as you said. I remember going to the School of Oriental and African Studies to the pub there, and the the pint was supported by the government. So I paid 45p for a pint of Guinness. That was just amazing. It was, yes. and the atmosphere was really nice. And, but I wanted to move forward. And as we're talking, well, and, and using the exhibition of Mario Cravonato as an excuse, I think we have to, to speak a little bit about Mario Cravonato, your relationship with his work. And you came across his work in 1992, I think, at the yes. Photo Fest in Houston. Correct. And you mentioned that uh, you saw his photos displayed in a room close to Funny Coyote's work. And yeah. the relationship of their work was something that was quite important to the, a new way of seeing contemporary photography. And completely different works with completely different backgrounds, but with some cultural symbolic relations well louise and look i mean 19, 19, 1991 92 you know I, I i was in houston texas wrote to me fanny coyote the nigerian artist who was based in uk queer um living in brixton and um, with his white boyfriend and making these incredibly transgressive images around desire around displacement around loss around being an outsider very complicated beautiful yoruba informed kind of cosmological work had, had never really been seen and never really been blown up in any meaningful way. It was very much, you know, still almost unknown apart from locally within the kind of UK and maybe a couple of people in, in, in the States. So when Fred and Wendy Baldwin, you know, visit, visit the work and Alex Hurst, his boyfriend, helps them, you know, display the work. And I'm not expecting anything other than to seeing really nice, finely, large scale, you know, wrote to me Fanny Coyote prints on display. Incredibly, as I walk into the space, there's Mar <laughs> Mario Cravenetto's work beside it. And the, you know, the correlation between them was kind of seismic in terms of my thinking, because I couldn't quite, you know, reconcile the relationship, the man, the, 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 the nuanced sense of Mario Crava's work cheek by jowl again, side by side with um, Wrote Me Fanny Coyote. So I'm young, I'm 31, and I'm looking at this outsider from, you know, Nigeria, who's queer, othered, and parents escaped to, in, in exile. And I'm looking at this other incredible guy exiled within his own kind of consciousness, right? In his own state of mind. He's looking for something else. He's fundamentally locked into this similar cosmology in terms of symbols, signs, and places. And, I've, and I figured there is, because we were talking at the time about, you know, a, a lot about political blackness, this space of being, this, oppos this oppositional kind of, you know, we know the epidermal schema in a Fanonian sense is with us, fan spanon. We know, we know this through the work in black skin, white masks. But we also know that the kind of, you know, identity formations are not just about the epidermis, right? They're not just about the skin. And I, seeing Mario's work and understanding who he was and this level of consciousness he was looking through in terms of creating this incredible visual dynamic, which referenced this Yoruba spirituality right next door to these colorful um, Yoruban pieces by Fanny Coyote, it seemed to me as if somehow the transatlantic dialogue between them was speaking in Houston. And it was quite a remarkable moment, right? Quite a remarkable moment because it was exciting to have that on the one hand, 
val to validify Rotimi's work in terms of what he was addressing through his cultural references and to have it echoed, but not spoken to in the same way by Mario as a kind of Brazilian, you know, with his own cultural baggage in, in the background. Somehow there was this sense that these, uh, this, this Yoruba kind of haunting in their contemporary presence, one dead, one alive, one looking for something, one literally passed. There was a very particular atmosphere for me across their works. And I have to say, actually, such was the, uh, such was the, the correlation that sometimes you see things, obviously one is reading a lot, but sometimes you see the thing and it kind of fits together in terms of the complicated transgressive nature of what you're feeling, that praxis that we talk about, the embodiment, the feeling of the work was very, very real in that space. And I, and the, and I never thought it. And the, and the work of Cravonetto- the exhibition. And, and the work of Cravonetto was the Eternal Now series that was shown? Absolutely, yeah. So oh, the black and white. Black and white beautiful, yeah. the swan with the eye and the, the and the prints were both the both Rotomi's prints were very beautiful, both working on medium format, you know, both 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 beautiful, you, you know, the, the 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 investment in production was very, very very was very beautiful. It was incredibly seductive as well. That was the other thing as well. It was so it was so rare to see the black subject in photography not fundamentally exoticized or problematized. What was nice about it is that it was trying to communicate something about an, another way of being. It's funny because he's saying that uh, it was nice to see the work and the central aspect of the work. I heard you in an interview mentioning that when Mapplethorpe was showing in London in 91, I think, there was some, well, suspicion about the work and then Stuart Hall came and said, oh, I love the work and it's beautiful. The black body, even the black penis that he was mentioning was nice to see. And then it shift the reading of the work and people could see the beauty of, of, of the work. And, and Mapo Top, I think, is a crossing reference between the two because in a way you can see Mapo Top through Cravonetu and you can see in, in, in Fanny Coyote. Do you think there is a relation between the triangle relation between the three? I think um, I think Rotomi for sure was very aware because he was in New York, right? He was he was he, he, yeah. he was very aware of um, uh, and also um, Mario was also in New York as well. They, they they knew what was happening for sure around the representation of the black body. And I, w without a doubt, um, Maple thought was in people's consciousness. You know, in it, it's so easy to look at an artist like Mabel Thorpe and say black exploitation, you know, exploiting the black male body, et cetera, et cetera. It's much harder to look at it and say, wow, that's, there's, there's something in there that is desirable, right? It's, there's something in there because when you, when you're confronted in front of the print and the beautiful space, there is something, there is something of course, transgressive in that space. And that's hard for people to get their head around sometimes, right? There, there are, there are all kinds of things happening in that work. There are mm -hmm. some good things and there are some bad things, but there are for sure some challenging aspects of the relationship to the camera, the person behind the camera, the subject, in much the way that the male gaze around women's bodies are pro pro problematized. Okay, so we know these things, but there are other things which emerge. And if you're honest enough, you can name them. And I think what Stuart Hall was trying to do on that day was to say, yes, I agree with all these problematics, but it's not just about that problematic space, right? And I think I, I, I think Rotomi moved it on the body politic of desire, the body politic of the erotic. He moved it into a place of ownership, where the ownership was very much through: look, I have access to another world. <laughs> I have the key to this pyramid. But you're not. You you can't just look at this black body through the lens of Maplethorpe, I'm gonna encourage you and I'm gonna open this door and you're gonna look at it through the lens of my African experiences, my cosmology, my culture, my sense of being a, a Yoruba person. And if you do the work, if you're honest enough to do the work, if you find out where I'm from, you too 
can share the magic of this image, which I'm presenting to you in this moment. And I also think the spirituality of Mario's journey into the religious space, into the spiritual, into the eternal space of, uh, of, of, of freedom, where, the, where you can just go, right? Where, you, where all the inhibitions are left behind. He too, I do believe, is referencing that key to that door, which unlocks us into another place. That's nice. And then after 1992, I think you met him personally, and then you showed Cravonette with autograph. Correct. We showed Eternal, some of the images from Eternal Now and La Royer, because I wanted to have that conversation around the street, the body, the performative, the real, the document, the not real, the staged, you know, every, everything was staged, the color, the black and white, because I've, want, you know, I mean, our space is not a huge space. We could never have done a retrospective, but I wanted to journey to arc across those two particular practices. And we met in the south of France in Arles. He was having an, an exhibition and he wasn't so well. Um, I think it was towards the end, end of his life. And I explained to him that I'd seen the work and we had a similar conversation to you and I, and we ended up, uh, um, he was quite hostile. <laughs> But we, we ended up being, um, we, as, as I knew he would be, an awkward character. His line was, who's this black guy from London talking about my work? What's this about? What do you want? What have you got? <laughs> I, I think he was very aware of the fact that he doesn't have much time on the planet left and he didn't want to waste any. But we ended up talking for two, three, four hours. And I, I made a commitment that I would try and bring his work to London um, in a meaningful way so that people could introduce that. And it took a little longer than I than I'd anticipated, but it happened. In the in the end, and I was it's, it's a and I wanted to, again to to try and share that experience of you know um, identity formation through his work, you know connection, culture, closeness, um, transformation through and, him, you know because he because because in my in, in my view he was one of those artists which I say give you that goosebump real deal feeling right. And how was the reception of Kravosnato's work in the autograph? And did yeah, people I mean, knew I, that he was a Brazilian artist? And oh, we fully we 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 had um, Christian. His son was there, and we did lots of public talks around the work, his practice. We talked. We are uh, we unpacked the, his life story, um, his journey. Christian was fantastically supportive, and still is. Um, so I mean, we're friends. I hope I, 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 we haven't spoke for a while, but I, I can consider he, he made the, he made the thing possible. So it was be beautiful. And I think that was the point. People, I think when we explained where he was coming from and his life experience and the impact of being so close to that Yoruba African everyday moment in his life, there, I think people really did engage with what he was trying to engage with, which was to get close to something that he cared about, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He just cared about that space. He loved that space. And that's it. I think once you, once people get, this is one of the things I say about, you know, the other, you know, if we can bring people closer together, then the other becomes much more conversational, much more closer, much more, less alien. And if people become less alien, it's much harder to hate them, right? Because you know them, right? And I think that's what Mario does. He He decides that, He's going to unpack his inhibitions. He's going to let it go. And he's going to dive into this other world and allow that world to impact on who he is, fundamentally. True, true. And as you mentioned this, um, well, perspective of the other, I think we can jump a little bit to, to your book, the Declining the Camera Photography in Ratio Time. And in the... In the introduction you you start with two questions that i think will be well developed throughout the book the first one is you ask has photography been a liberating device or an oppressive weapon that holds the viewer producer and citizen subject in a violent system of colonial exposure and the second one is, and I think this one is, well, where I wanted 
to focus. And you ask, what epistemic value has photography brought to our understanding of difference? I think this is an extremely important mm. question. Mm. And I think that this question you tackle and it is the core of the book. And repeating the question, what epistemic value has photography brought to our understanding of difference? And so, and concerning this question of difference, do you think that this is something to be captured or constructed by the camera? Good question. I think um, both. You know, I quite like the idea of the um, multi-headed hydra, this snake, mm -hmm. which can do several things. You know, you have to do to get to get to get close to it, it's very dangerous. To allow to allow it to look into its face can be, you know, can can freeze you out, can can turn you to stone, can do all kinds of things. So I think photography is a bit of a monster in terms of when we talk about difference. And I think what we what I'm really saying is that there hasn't been enough voices across photography yet. I think the vo the the, the it, it's been pretty obvious that it's been dominated by a Eurocentric perspective. It's been put to work as a kind of tool for colonial discourses. It's shaped difference through um, racial hierarchies. It's helped make that case. It's become a technology, or it has been a technology, that has been, you know, predominantly excluded to, you know, the black subject. Even if the black subject had it, had had the tool in their hands, the work wasn't taken seriously or, or seen as part of the overall discourse of photography. Um, so I think it's more to do with if photography is a modern language from say 1839, the language that it's been speaking is fundamentally one of the imperialist. Mm -hmm. So until we have a more nuanced, balanced conversation and those other um, words, those other sentences, those other paragraphs, those other meanings, can come into its um, into its um, uh, vocabulary, which is beginning to happen now, then I think uh, it was always speaking from a pretty homogenizing space. So its epistemic value was a knowledge system that echoed all of the other technologies that were working, what I would say, the black body to the bone. <laughs> it was extracting meaning which was degrading and dishonest and all about denial and construction rather than empathy and building a kind of argument for you know, cultural par parity rather than cultural erasure. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and when you, well, the title is Decolonizing the Camera and I wonder if is it the camera that has to be decolonized or is it the gaze and the discourse that frame the image produced by the camera? Well, it's the, the, the title is a, is a very playful one, decolonizing a box with a, a light <laughs> lens in front of it is, is, is neither here nor there. But you know, it's a, it's a play because uh, you're right, it's the tool. It's how you apply the tool and who's behind it. So you can't just look at the at the camera and go, I'm going to decolonize this camera. It's about what when you pick that thing up, what kind of responsibility that comes with it, you know? And I think that's why it's it's not just something, you know, if if you you, you can't, you know, it you can't just drive this visual eye at anything and say, this is how I see the world without, you know, thinking about the history of the medium. And I think when you have a camera, a bit like a car, you have responsibility for what's in it, right? So however you drive it, wherever you go with it, whatever you decide to do with it, it can either be disastrous. If you're reckless with it, you won't, it, it will do damage. If you're more careful with what you're considering and you enter into dialogue with the spaces and places that you care for and try and record rather than, you know, take, snap, shoot, all the language behind photography, you know, grab, <laughs> crop, 
it's a kind of interesting discourse around it all. And then if we if we if we don't if we, if we don't take, I guess what I'm really saying is that it is an extension of one's eye, right? If that's the case, this is how uh -huh. we see. So that yeah. eye is connected to the psychology of all of those all of those places that we come from. And if we're framed in that um, European kind of knowledge system, then what the market, what the gallery, what the collector, what the history of photography has kind of done is, uh, is offers us now a very clear vision of how the European, the European eye saw the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. no, because I think that there is someone behind the camera and there is someone in front of the image. And so there is also the responsibility of who's seeing it and how can you create a situation and that's i would say it's a sort of curatorial epistem to uh try to foster a different reading of what o olho is, europeu viu uh, o resto do mundo the, image, eu acho que há through this reading through the discourse through the relationships that you produce showing it in Yes, different well, relations. You create a different movement. As you know, Louise, I've also said in 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 the text that um, it is it's almost as if what's really important is what's as important as what's outside the frame. So it's the context of which we read the work within, and that's where we have to do more work. I think we're all within those didact, excuse me, all within those didactics, all within those all the stuff outside of the space. I mean, one of the examples I give, which, which I think illustrates the point very well. Wayne Miller is a white American photographer. And there's a photograph which I reproduced in the book and there are very few photographs reproduced in the book. So there's this, this one image, I'll, I'll go very quickly. So, so bear with me. It's very simple. It's a black man photographed from behind sitting with his son, a small child, black child. And they're both looking in Chicago on the shoreline across the lake. It's a beautiful photograph, very rare intimate moment between a black man and what I'm presuming is his son. It's a day out somewhere. It's very calm. No faces, just their backs, his big, broad, powerful back. And the sun is like a, an echo of what could be just beautifully sculpted young child. When you know that in 1919, almost on the very spot that that photograph was taken, the young black boy was swimming in the ocean, in the, on, on, in the lake, and a white person threw a rock and hit the boy on the head while he was swimming and killed him. It adds a totally different context to that location in 1947, right? And all of a sudden, the black man's gaze becomes not one of, what's the word, where, you, where you're behind him and you're thinking how relaxing this atmosphere is. It becomes one of potential hypervigilance. It becomes one of protection. It becomes one about locating, well, what, was, what else was happening in 1947, post-World War II, Chicago? We know these were incredibly difficult and violent times for black people. So it becomes another story. And, the, and, and it's about, this is the curatorial twist. You can deny the politics of that space and just talk about the aesthetics of that image, or you can open the door to the social conditions of which these people were living in. And then we can begin to read the dip. But then we can begin to read the image through the lens of more and maybe a different kind of knowledge system. That's perfect. I completely agree. <clears throat> well, still in your book, you, and your first chapter discusses Alice Harris uh, images at Congo in early 20th century. And it develops along the century, in six chapters, and culminates with the, well, I would say, institutional and commercial success of Seydou Keita and uh, Malik Sidibe, right. both from Mali. And this outstanding development, does it mean that we are now living in a post-colonial or in a new colonial global art scene? I don't think we're post-colonial and I don't think we're in a new colonial. 
I think there is a, I think what for, that, that's a very good question, actually. I, I, I think that's the way that I, the only way that I can describe my thinking around that, it's that it's an evolving colonial. It's a colonial that twists and turns and narrates through a variety of different channels. I don't think it's pre or post or in the colonial. I think there is this kind of, you know, matrix of power that the, that the colonial represents. And I think it's very, you know, it has cloaking devices, you know, like, like in these science fiction, it's invisible at times, but it's present and it's kind of dangerous. And I think we have to be very mindful about using words like when something is over, that we're past something. It's like thinking about it like slavery. All that's happened, I think, is that slavery may well have been legislatively abolished, but people are still living and working in conditions of slavery, right? So it's not over. It's, it's if anything, it's more, it's just evolved. And I think, you know, we're in neoliberal times where even, you know, the air above us is commodified. And these are very difficult things for people to get their head around. So I think we have to be very careful about, we, I, I think we are in a, in, we are in colonizing times. This is why I like the idea of thinking about race and time, you know, I think I want to remind people that, you know, being a black subject in this time is very different from being a white subject in this time, because we are in different almost dynamics. And those colonialities are part of that dynamic as we go, kind of like go forward. And I think sometimes, and I absolutely mean this, that, you know, we, we, live, in, we live in different times, but they sometimes collide. They, they move in different trajectories. And I think, you know, some, some spaces and places of being for people, how they can progress, even though we share the same time and date are archaic in terms of their opportunities. And some places for people in time and space where we're at are accelerated. They have infinite opportunities. They can go beyond their imagination. So these are the kind of, these, this is the idea of thinking about racial politics, about opportunity, time, pace, evolution, opportunity, how we see, how we read, what, we get to, what, what, gets, what gets considered uh, um, rich or poor, what gets, what, what gets culturally valued. So I think this idea of being pre, post, or in the colonial, I think all that's happened is that it twists and shapes. It's like black, it's like, it's like, it's like dark matter. It's just this mass that we're in, right? It's, we don't understand it now because there's so much of it around us. It's in our cosmology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that in the, the last chapter, Louise, I just want to I just want to say what one thing. It's about yeah, sure. Part part of this is about things in the present, things in the past, and things future to come. And I think there's an awful lot in our pasts, which are still still haunting our contemporary conversations concerning race. And until we've had what I would say an honest conversation about how we reconcile those things that haunt our present, <laughs> then we are doomed to live in a kind of state of kind of uh, anxiety around this question of race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think is interesting in the last chapter where you focus in the discussion of rights and recognition and the race issue is related with right and recognition and so yeah. i think this is quite important and and then in this last chapter you reproduce a debate between rashid arene and eddie chambers Correct. that happened on the pages of third text great magazine yes 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 i had the opportunity to collaborate with third text once and and then um rashid in sort of critical and polemical approach to one of the exhibitions curated by Chambers, uh, mentioned that he was disappointed with the exhibition by the fact that uh, artists were selected, he thought, only on the basis of being black photographers and dealing with black life and experiences. And he thought, it was time to pay more attention to the question of quality, <laughs> this sort of 
transcendental word quality. Mm -hmm. That was 1988. Uh, do you think that a sort of black aesthetic was created since then that would approach this idea of quality? And it's not a question of either or. And it's a question of how can um, we engage the ethnic with the aesthetic? I think what Eddie, uh, you know, I think Rashid was is was is is, is as always very provocative in in that in in his in his way of uh, it's right to to offer the the challenge, right? I I think it was um, um, I think presenting a platform in 1988 to have a conversation around black contemporary practices using photography and making them center stage was a radical act in terms of thinking about who was making what and what they were addressing within their work at that time. The aesthetic question is a little bit of a red herring in my view, because it was, a, it, it was about, create, most of these artists were very young, um, 1988, most of them had either just left art school or were, were certainly, most of them were all under 40. So they were, they were, they were it was very young practice, but what Eddie was very good at and, and what his curatorial point was is that we need to take this work on and we need to create a critical, we need to create a critical dialogue for this work so that we can begin to make the aesthetic connections across the work so that we can begin to draw it out and understand it so that we can begin to really be, you know, what, what, what I think what was also very important for Eddie was the writing, right? He wanted to have you know, the writing about the work in place so that people could understand it in future generations in terms of the, the points of reference that were being made. So the aesthetic question for me, people might not always have been able to get the reference points, right? It might not have been an aesthetic that was there for everybody to digest. And I think Rashid was maybe thinking about, you know, a more conservative aesthetic value around photography than what some of these artists were doing, which were also trying to push the boundaries of what photography was doing. So I think it was um, uh, one of those kind of like two stags in the headlights moment <laughs> where people were looking for a position, a, a power, a, 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 a position of power around authority. And third text at that time was, um, I think Rashid's comment was both, both right and both wrong. And I think what Eddie was doing with the DMAX exhibition was trying to just amplify these practices and at least give them some air, right? Give them some voice, get them in the white cube, get people talking about them, get artists to be able to stand back, to break down the privileges that other artists have had. And if some of the work wasn't very good aesthetically, then let's have the conversation. I think that's what Eddie was really about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, but at least well, allow these at least allow these artists through the door. At least allow uh -huh. them to stand back and see their work. At least allow them to see their work in relation to to um, um, other other practitioners. At least, I mean, and in that exhibition, actually, some of the work has gone on to become incredibly important. Ingrid Pollard's work, you know, pastoral interludes and pieces like that, have highly valued pieces now. So time may well have worked for that exhibition because people might have caught up with what people were actually doing. Mm -hmm. no, it's, it's, I think it was in 1989 that Rashid curated the show at Hayward, Correct. other other stories. So, That's right. And, and, and I think that, well, knowing a little bit Rashid's writing, I think that uh, his question touches the uh, modernist heritage. And shall we appropriate the modernist heritage and deal with alternative narratives and alternative poetics inside modernist um, heritage, or shall we uh, bypass modernist heritage? Well, I think artists like Maud, Maud Salter, who was very prolific at the time, understood what she was doing was breaking with tradition mm -hmm. and going off into different places. So here we have 
you know, mixed race Scottish Ghanaian, you know, artist who's, you know, who's queer, who's doing um, incredible work. Um, it's, it's historical work, it's montage, it's using photography in a totally different uh, uh, way. It's bold, it's talking about, you know, feminist histories and radical, um, po radical poetry in, involved in that. And I think Maud, you know, struggled to find places that would show the work, right? She, she, she wasn't, you know, it wasn't easy. And I think, uh -huh. but now, again, because of the radical nature of it, kind of this is what I mean by racial time. People are just about catching up with, with, with the brilliance that, that she had. At the time, you might add that modernist lens on it and think mm, that's not, that hasn't got it, right? <laughs> Whatever that is. But now it's, it's, it's breaking with that linkage and adding that kind of, you know, um, cultural heritage, background, otherness, difficult trajectories into it means that the work becomes, you know, it becomes, it, it stands out because it's so bold, you know? Uh -huh. It breaks that link. It's not trying to be anything other than a conversation with the things that concern the artists and their stories, right? Breaking ground. Yeah, what I think it's interesting is that they're both militant critics and, yeah. and they both want to produce alternative narratives to mainstream art history. And so I thought that was quite interesting. I mean, as you said, the, the question is, let's, let's talk about it. Let's yeah. discuss even what is quality at that time, to whom, in what direction it, does it move? And so I think that was quite interesting. I think, that was where, I think that's, that's, that, that's the key point. It's like, can, can they enter the conversation? Can we create spaces? I mean, autograph is part of that. Can we create spaces where artists can enter the conversation, please? Can we not, can we, can we not, can it not always be through the lens of marginalization? I think people were trying to, you know, break through. And if it meant that we had to um, say, you know, 10 black photographers working through 10 different black experiences, then so be it. At least then we begin to understand that there's not some homogenizing, you know, black practice or way of being. I mean, you know, it was a really exciting time what people were trying to do, pushing the, pushing, pushing the camera and pushing visual culture all over the place. They, they, you know, postmodernism had arrived, if you like, the gloves were off, people were trying to do things and, you know, some of them were failing, some of them would never make photography again and some of them went on to really carve out very important and, define, and, and, and period defining pieces. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. I mean, Sunil Gupta, period defining pieces now, which are highly collectible. Um, Shubha de Biswas, her piece, you know, synapses at the Photographer's Gallery, period defining pieces. Zarina Bimji, period defining pieces. Again, Ingrid Pollard, incredible, incredible pieces which people want now and they've become really important points of reference, starting points, points to jump off, points to talk about the politics of our time. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can talk a little bit about your curatorial work. And you just uh, did this amazing show in Houston, the photo fest that was called um, African Cosmologies. And I want to, to bring to the conversation what you said, I um, read an interview with you and you said, that Africa is everywhere mm. now. And, and that you want to elevate our way of thinking about it, about Africa from geography to cosmology. And can you develop it a bit further? And I know that there were at least two Brazilian artists on it, uh, Rosana Paulino and Eustáquio Neves. Correct. And, and do you think that for instance, a work such as Cravoneto would be part of this African cosmology. I believe so. Yes, absolutely. I'd see no reason why that 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 is uh, um, absolutely part of that cosmology. This is why when we say, when I say kind of Africa is everywhere, it's just hard to imagine Africa not being everywhere. It's much it's much harder to walk down the street and not find Africa. It really is. 
because it's just so prolific from music to the things that we need in our lives, from the rubber on our tires, from the things in our mobile phones, that's the, the extraction part of it, from the diamonds on our fingers, the thing out you know, from the material violent stuff that's there. But it's also in our jazz, in our music, in our popular culture. It's kind of like, it's impossible not to make the case for Africa being everywhere. And I think if we realize that it's predominance as a kind of cultural force is a bedrock of kind of civilization and life. And what vibrates out of there, what vibrates from those spaces kind of constantly shudders around the world. So it's, in, it's just everywhere. I mean, and, when I, and I think all I was really trying to say very playfully is that instead of thinking about Africa as something that is downtrodden, we need to think about the, the excitement of it as something that's in the air and influences all the time that we can learn, that we can absolutely learn from. And if we allow Africa to become a place of learning for us, we might just begin to re-understand and revalue everything globally that we benefited from and take that on board as a place of kind of nurturing and care you know and and i try to reference people like john coltrane in that space right the whole idea of searching for all of these connections and threads and spiritualities and ways of being through the kind of uh, being open to these different rhythms that of course the continent is full of and its diasporic connections and the literature and everything that's come out of that place it's it's impossible not to see it as being as being everywhere and we should, and that I, I think is something to celebrate yes we know it's deeply troubled in places yes we know that the colonial imperial past and legacies are still at play yes we know there are fault lines across all those spaces as they are in europe as they are in north america as they are in many places or they are across the americas but i do think sometimes it's important just to go you know what? Africa is everywhere. <laughs> it, it's, it's funny because I think that um, where I see a lot um, Cravonetto's African cosmology uh, is, for instance, in the way that he photographs the candomblé rituals and the way that his camera embraces it and the way that his camera is has intimacy with the ritual and recently i saw the steve mcqueen small x films and the second one uh, lovers rock it's Love this Love rock, yes yes this amazing film with this well he films a party and this well black party this black experience with music with dance with food with, well, getting together and all the tensions, all the love around it. And I think that the way that he films it remembered me a lot, the way that Cravo Neto photographed the, the Candomblé and the Bayanas and the camera is inside it and you feel it. Yes, and, well, you know, I mean, the, the, the atmosphere of, you know, when someone is close to something, that they're not an observer, that they're part of something. You know, at Autograph, we've been talking a lot about caring, nurturing. I also like this idea of um, having images that are restful. You know, it doesn't mean that they're not loud or noisy, or, or but having images that just allow you to settle and enjoy the place that you're looking at. So they don't you know, and I think parts of what Mario's intimacy is about is about allowing you to also just be at rest in that place, to be almost part of the congregation. To, to you know, when Aretha Franklin sings um, Amazing Grace, <laughs> when she has that album and you, and you put it on, you go to church. <laughs> <laughs> When Steve McQueen, 
when Steve McQueen puts his camera in the Lover's Rock party, you go to church, right? When Mario Cravenetto puts his camera in the candom blaze space and place, you go to church, right? You become part of the congregation, right? And at that point, when you're finished with that experience, you feel rested, you feel nourished, you feel like you've had something to share, right? And it's not an intellectual game. It's not some great PhD moment. It's a place of actually saying, I went to church and I stood next to these people and we did something together. And most of what they did together was to turn around and say these simple words, I love being with you. And, and, and how the work works in this direction. Yeah. And I guess that's, you know, on a personal level, as I get older, you know, become more inclined to think, you know, like this place of care and love and rest and solitude and finding, you know, um, Santu Mufeking had this in part of his work, the South African photographer, right? Santu had this sense of, you know, going into ritualized spaces and caring for, for his, for his uh, uh, people in that sense. Ernest Cole had this as well, the great South African photographer, the, the sense of like, I'm going to care for you, right? Roy de Carava had this sense of care. Van Lee Burke, the British photographer, also had this sense of care for, the, for this community. So this, this is, you know, the, the Dawood Bay has it, you know, Carrie Mae Weems has it. Some of these artists, this is where I don't think it's about aesthetics. I think it's about care. And if you open, if the channels, if you allow yourself to be open to that space, as I say, you go to church with them and you're in the congregation, they've got the pulpit. And if you listen hard enough, not listen, if you're open enough, don't, I mean, this idea about listening, it's not, it's not, if you're open enough, you will take something nourishing from it. That's what I mean by Africa is everywhere. Fela Kuti, you know, Miriam Makeba, you know, Nelson Mandela, you know, fans, Fanon from Martinique working in Algeria, you know, resistance spaces, uh, you know, um, Patrice Lumumba speaking on Independence Day. That's everywhere. That's not just about the Congo. That's about freedom and liberation. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about decolonizing the camera. It's, it's the image of this black man taking, you know, uh, out of the Balduino king. Yes, yes. Taking this... Taking King Baudouin's sword as a reactive yeah. moment is a great taking the sword and being the image is is just amazing. Yeah. And he looks Lebec, to the camera. It's just incredible. Lebec's photograph is unbelievable. And you know, and, and it's just just the image itself, the work that image does on the on the on on, on the cultural imagination. You want to it's like wow, he took the king's sword and yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing, right? It's just fun. It's you have to write about that photograph. We have to look at that moment because yeah. what it does do is it absolutely sets the stage for the understanding of the relationships to those two men in the car. And we know that, you know, within six months, Lumumba is violently assassinated. Yeah. So when I read Richard, when I, when I read Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man and we talk about, you know, almost simultaneously in terms of time that, you know, violently Lumumba is put in a vat of acid to disappear his bones, then it's like the reality of that is, is quite profound. Yeah. And <clears throat> as you talking a lot about this sort of sonic aspect of um, the cultural world I read that your inspiration to curatorial work is John Coltrane and John Coltrane because his music is multi-directional and I think this is very interesting even to think about the way that you know an art space and an art critic as you is trying to um, displace and redirect 
the mainstream uh, narratives. You know, when you listen to Coltrane, not all the notes are sweet, right? Yeah. Some of it's very difficult stuff because when you go looking, you go in the, you know, we go, sometimes you go in the wrong direction. Sometimes you find that sweet spot. Sometimes you find the, the easy place. Sometimes you find the place of rest. Sometimes you find the place of labor. But yeah, I think trying to work through the difficult things, the, the, the things that are hard to, to get through. One, I think that's really what I, 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 I'm drawn to, like a, like a you know, moth to the candle. I'm drawn, I, I, I like to be drawn to the difficult things because otherwise I'm cast. Otherwise, I'm allowed and become this stereotypical thing, right? This I'll be cast. I, I think I have, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm drawn to things that I don't know. And I think that's the line of inquiry. And I think what Coltrane was, was drawn to was trying to search, just keep on searching for this thing, this place when you find, you know, the, the, when you find the connections, because they're there, we just have to look hard enough, right? And I think that's the that's when I that's when I talk about um, Emmanuel Levinas's work. You know, the the idea of if I look into your face without taking responsibility for you, that's a fault line in me, right? So I'm, if I don't see the humanity in you, and all I can see is some form of uh, other creature that I can afford to ignore, then I am lost. And that's the hard work. And I think photography can play a very particular role in 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 helping us understand that we do have a responsibility for each other. And mm -hmm. that's the searching that I empathize with, with, you know, I wish I could play, play, you know, really well and find those notes, but we try and do it through words and images and photographies happens to be the place that, you know, that's the instrument because I'm not interested really in the history of photography. I've said this loads of time. What I'm interested in is the work that images do in culture. That's different. Can you develop it a bit further? Yeah, I mean, I think this. We, I think we've been talking about it now. It's like when you put something out in the world, what's the work it's doing? What's it seeing? What? Yeah. How is it resonating? What? Who's it speaking to, and, and what for, and in what time? Beyond so what, the frame. Beyond the frame. What's its purpose? Where, where, what do we want it to do? Where do we want it to go? How do we want it to speak to us? What kind of rhythms do we want out of it? Does it seek pleasure? Does it seek pain? Does it seek understanding? Does it seek closeness? Does it seek violence? Do you understand the violence that you might be presenting to me? Do we, if we're gonna, the context just, and the context shifts in time, right? It's not fixed, it's just not. It, this is this idea that you can, each time I go to a photograph, I'm a different person when I go to that photograph because time has done some work on me. Something else has happened. I simply got older, but I've changed every time. And potentially the image meaning that I'm looking at might change. I know this for a fact because, you know, when I look at images of say my children tomorrow, it's not the same relationship I have with them today because they've changed and I've changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's our world, right? To meaning shifts. So I'm always interested in the time and place of how we have these conversations. I'm not trying to lock it down, I'm trying to keep it open, right? I'm trying to keep the conversation open, I'm trying to keep history open. I'm trying to keep, you know, trying to keep the fire next time, you know, Baldwin in the conversation. I'm trying to just, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make mistakes and I'm trying to get things hopefully right sometimes. And I think that's okay, you know? I think it's really important that we drive that we that we drive off 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 uh, off piece as well sometimes. I think curatorially and as artists and as creatives and as thinkers, we have to make mistakes because if we don't make mistakes, we won't we we, we might not be able to find the thing we're looking for. We might not even know what it looks like. I agree completely. Well, so we have friend Stu Hall says it's an it's an part part of this is an unfinished conversation. I I, I expect to die. With no, with nothing else other than I was in the conversation for a little while, both personally and politically. Hopefully, I don't. Know, oh. but that's all we can do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
and well to open the conversation a bit beyond the two of us there are some questions from the audience and i'm bringing to you and I'm, i'll be translating for you okay. one is from juan stevis and he say mark in brazil 59 um, young black people die per day murdered and this in a way um, fostered the photographer Edu Simões, who is a, a white artist, to publish a book last year. And do you think that this exchange and interaction between social critics uh, can um, get deeper in the way that it will um, help to diminish racial distance through art? Do you think that this sort of work that has as a subject this the murder of 59 black artists well, it's per, people statistic. per day? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, shocking. It's a statistic first and foremost. I didn't know the statistics. It's um, it's unbelievable. Yeah. So there you are. So there's a learning moment for both you and I. Yeah. Um, and if that's a learning moment for you and I, then hopefully that's a learning moment for other citizens who also have on their kind of um, conscious this statistic. And it's unacceptable. That's the most important thing. And the question is, what do we do to change that? And if bringing that statistic to our consciousness through photography helps change the direction to make the numbers less and eradicate that violence, then, um, then that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the work the work should, should, should be doing. It might not, it, it might, it, you know, the question is who, 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 does it, who, who does it get to and how do we, and how do we, uh, how do we put that work to work? Um, it's difficult, you know, I mean, I think we have to, we have to record these things. We have to talk about these things. We have to, you know, try and build a dialogue with the people who are close to these to these to these issues. And I think we have to take some degree of responsibility in our news media, in our television. These stories just have to be told. And I think we have to also make sure that we've got a, 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 um, a, a kind of a, a diverse a, a diversify people who can also tell those stories right so it's not just the white guy going in there with a camera photographing black victims it's also let's let's empower those who, who are really close to the to the field to keep on telling those stories also um, there's another one from Vilma Neres and she asked um, uh, Mark uh, from your experience at Autograph, what do you suggest to a younger generation of photographers, women, uh, men, uh, no binary person, uh, that beyond the difficulties of insertion in the photography space, they try to affirm a discourse in diversity through their visual narratives. What are the suggestions to these young artists for you to go beyond the difficulties of introducing their work? Sorry, Louise, I don't quite understand the question. Can you go, can you go again? Yeah. From your experience at Autograph, yeah. what do you suggest to a younger generation of artists to go beyond the difficulty to introduce their photography and their discourse in the institutions or in the world? You know, I think it's a really good question. I think they, they have to do the work. They have to keep, they have to keep, they have to believe in what they're doing because there'll always be these barriers. They're, it's going to be very difficult for people to, to, like back in 1988, there was a desk and a telephone and you know a sense of um you know me banging on people's doors saying can you look at this person's work can you look at this per person's work trying to find the resources i think you just have to 
in, ma in many ways, try and um, um, generate agency for the, for, the, for the work that's actually going on, try and generate that agency. And I think, I'm not suggesting, I don't know whether it will be successful or not. I hope, I hope it will be. I think if we, I think if artists push the envelope and keep on pushing that envelope, that's hard to do, but I think it's essential that you that we carry on. I've seen very successful artists come in and out of favor. People like Carrie Mae Weems, you know, um, people were looking at the work early, people were not looking at the work, then they're looking at the work again. You know, people like um, Estakio Nevis, I think I published his first, first, first work from, from London. There are many ways of being in the conversation. I think you just, and now with, I think with some of the digital tools we've got, it's easier to amplify the work than it was say 30 years ago. I think that's important to be able to just try and make the thing relevant and keep pushing that door. We have to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's no one, there's no silver lining to this. It's just, again, back into the musician. You just have to keep, keep trying, keep bread on the table. <laughs> yeah. Try and invest in the work. Yeah, yeah. And at Autograph, it's just a, a personal question. Um, do you also deal with youngsters, younger generation or, or more mature artists or both? Well, we work across the field. We, we, we create even pathway conversations so that young people can see a future in, in photography at university or an art course. We, we, and also I'm very concerned with, uh, with older artists who have maybe been overlooked. And of course, in between, we do try and offer a kind of, um, what's the word, different opportunities across the spaces. We, you know, across the across how we engage with people. Sometimes we talk to younger artists for maybe three, four years. And you collect as well. Yes, the collection. collection. Is, yeah, we we again with exhibitions, we commission work, and we um, part of that relationship to commissioning new work, like many institutions, is that we try and have a small portfolio of images that enter the collection, which is growing now, which is fantastic. And that becomes something that people can loan on, can reference on, etc. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, then just see if there is there's no more questions from the audience. No. Well, you want to say something else, Mark? It's open to you. Maybe you're tired. It's quite late in London now. Oh, no, it's, it's 20 past 11. I'm a bit of a night early. No, the, what I wanted to say, actually, is that, you know, Mario, back, because I, I, I am really honoured to be in the room this evening, and thank you very much for the invitation. It's very, it's very humbling in many ways. Um, I sensed with Mario that there was, you know, a bit like Coltrane, a searching soul, kind of in the dark somewhere. And, you know, the things that we discussed weren't to do with you're black and I'm white. It was to do with just empathy of trying to make your way in the world. And he developed an incredible language. And I think I'm pleased that he has the big show, you know, with, with you. And, and I think trying to, you know, keep and recognize that language is very important. It might not be for everybody in every part of his career, but I think the good things that he was trying to do, the openness and the honesty in terms of his human, human subjectivity was, was, was very powerful. And, it, and occasionally, you know, special people come along like Rotomi Fanny Coyote, like Mario Cravenetto, and you know Maud Salter and many many others it, 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 who 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 share more than who want to share more than they take, and I think that's the difference between a colonial mindset and somebody say like Mario or Rotimi. The colonialists, they come and they take and they leave you empty, hollow, robbed, soulless. 
the kind of people like Mario want to give you more than actually take from you. And I think they're the artists that I really like and that I really respect. And I think he was someone that was trying to give us more than he took. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny because I remember while you were talking now, he was interviewed by a critic and Stefania Abreu, who we published in the, in the catalog set of her writings from the 80s. And she was quite close to Mario. And once she asked him, how is it possible that the same artists can produce these different works with so many different atmospheres, subjects? And then he said, oh, you know, because what I do is music. <laughs> yes. And I think this is the, the whole thing, you know, is create this, well, this polyphony to produce music and, and to be free. And he was a music lover, and and you can see in this in his well audio video works that the music is a part of it. And absolutely, never, never, never trust anybody who can't dance. Yes, exactly. <laughs> no, never That's trust it. anybody who won't dance. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Mark, it was a huge pleasure to listen to you. And as I said, to read your book, we have to translate it in Brazil. And uh, we, I will work in this direction. I want you to know. Yeah. And so thanks very much. I wanted also to thank you, the audience, who stayed with us through almost an hour and a half yeah. and well everyone from ims and so thank you very much hope to see you soon either in london or in brazil and to carry on with the conversation the conversation just started wonderful uh, deep gratitude to everybody for turning out tonight and i very much appreciate and as i say very humbled by the invitation and Congratulations and much respect for all the work you're doing down there. It's fantastic. Thank Good you. Luck. Thank Cheers. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.